you very much for all of you who've come to our last webinar of the year. Welcome to the Yod Sig Young Onset Dementia Special Interest Group, our last webinar of the year, which is titled Creative Engagement as a Therapeutic Tool in Young Onset Dementia. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you stand on today and pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders who are here on our webinar today. In our webinar, which will be hosted by Kate Swaffer, we have a number of exciting speakers of which they'll be introduced as they come about. And I'm very excited that this webinar has had almost 250 attendees from all over the world. So it's gonna be very exciting. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and it really gives me great pleasure to introduce our host, who's Kate. She'll be facilitating the webinar today. And we all probably know Kate, but she's been instrumental in bringing human rights to the fore in dementia and aged care including recognition in practice for dementia being recognized as a disability through published articles and books, presentations and global campaigning. Kate is co-founder, board member and human rights advisor to Dementia Alliance International, a global registered charity for people with dementia. Before we begin, we just have a few housekeeping rules of which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So please stay on mute. If you'd like to keep your cameras on, that's fine. However, we are going to be recording the webinar, so please turn your camera off if you don't wish to have that, your name or details recorded. There'll be question and answers, so please add them in the chat and we'll try and get to as many of them as possible at the end. If there's any other problems, just put other things in the chat and we'll try and get to you if there's any help required. And without further ado, I'll let Kate start. Thank you very much, Kate. Famous quote of the century, please unmute. <laughs> um, so I would like to welcome everyone. It's very exciting that we've got um, 68 here already in attendance and 249 people registered. Um, we realise that some people register even though they might be working and can't attend and that's so that they get a copy of the link to the recording afterwards. So we'd like to thank everybody for recording, whether they're here today or whether they're going to watch this afterwards. Um, and I would like to, the, the speakers um, got together before this and we made a decision that each speaker would uh, introduce themselves rather than me do a long um, introduction about them. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Sandy, um, who lives uh, with her husband in rural North Victoria. Uh, and like me, is a retired nurse. She's a retired midwife. Um, and she herself was diagnosed with young onset dementia. So Sandy, over to you. Just need your speaker off, Sandy. I'll see if I can unmute. Might be beyond my capacity. There we go. Fabulous, Sandy. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm reading a piece that I've put together with the help of um, my family. So I'll start from now. I think my symptoms started around the bushfires of the summer of 2019 and 2020. This was a very challenging time for me as I was recovering from the diagnosis of a uterine sarcoma, which was rare and aggressive. I had been working as a nurse and midwife for 40 years in Melbourne and Coryong and had just retired. Little did I know that my memory loss and unrecognised cognitive issues were not going away anytime soon. My GP sent me to Cadams in Wodonga to be assessed. There was evidence of cognitive impairment that day. After a long wait, I was admitted to the neuropsychology ward at the Royal Melbourne Hospital as an inpatient for two weeks of assessment and testing. My husband and two adult children supportive during this time. As if after a family meeting about two weeks after my assessment finished, 
the psychiatrist who led the team of a clinical psychologist, occupational therapist, social workers and resident doctors, and all the blood tests and scans I'd had, you can imagine I was exhausted. It was a long session of explanations of all the items on the screen showing how my brain was very different now to what it used to be. Numbness filled our bodies as we tried to understand how a vibrant, energetic woman could receive a diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's at the age of 65. My career had been satisfying and energetic. I couldn't believe that in the fullness of time, hoping to be a grandmother and wife and mother, that my dreams were going to be cut short. All this with no known pathway ahead. So how was I going to cope with the diagnosis? We tried to process the emotions of anger, disbelief, sadness, but this was very hard and the tears flowed. As far as we knew, there wasn't any dementia specifically um, in our families. My husband and children were very, very supportive and caring. It was their care and love towards me as that got me through those days and months after my diagnosis. Five days after my diagnosis, a letter arrived from Vic Rhodes advising me that I couldn't drive until I completed a driving assessment. 10 days later, an OT in Wodonga did a similar assessment for cognitive issues and, that I had already had in Melbourne. After those tests, I did a driving test, which didn't go very well in a very busy Wodonga. This made me very upset and felt like I had another whack of my confidence. Two weeks later, I went through a similar process in my local town, hopeful to obtain a restricted license in the end, I was allowed to drive 25 k's from home in a radius of that nature. It was spatial awareness issues that were the concern, as well as other things. This now means that Pete has to drive my husband any time past that circumference, which places extra responsibility on him and limits my movements when I'm away from home. Planning and organising activities or jobs in a day don't come easily and Pete helps me in prompts at certain times, especially if I'm running late. Um, anxiety kicks in and that makes it worse. I make lists of what I'm going to do during the day and try and follow it. Another hard thing to deal with is the fatigue of my two diseases that most days is apparent. I sleep more and still feel tired pretty easily. We were advised and encouraged by my psychiatrist to enter a trial called MAPS through the Royal Melbourne and Monash University. The project was driven by a psychologist and music therapist who wanted to combine both their skills to um, influence behaviour and emotions through, um, uh, sorry, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy. Music has always been part of my life. Before I was born, according to my mother, she and my father were, were singers. Both parents were in choirs all their lives and music permeated our home quite frequently. Music helps people living with dementia by reducing stress, anxiety, increases communication, supports cognitive function and memory and attention. When I worked in the aged care facility in Corriong, the residents loved listening to music and, if able, did some lovely dancing in the lounge room. They were more likely to be calm and happy after these sessions. Role changes have been varied in the last eight months. My husband has done all the work to get me into my aged care. He was very proactive in suggesting routines to help me through the day, such as keeping my glasses and my phone in a place visible like the table, so I wasn't spending time and getting frustrated looking for these things in the car, in the shed, in the home. I decided to clean out and store things um, of everyday life so that routines would be normal. It is easier to find what I needed to be given um, once I've given time. 
frustration and stress started to leave my daily program. This was worked, this has worked very well with me and support from Pete as he gently prompts me regularly. I feel guilty that my husband has to take responsibility for many things, but he took it all despite all of his work and interests. We got to the point of being able to talk about how we could work together and have good discussions. Our two children were very supportive and caring through this time. And after the diagnosis, they were able to read a lot about young onset dementia and the Tasmanian University investment into that um, space. It's been confronting for our children to realise that my dream of being a grandparent may not be as long as I hoped. But I'm doing all the things that I know will help me to live a healthy and happy life. Walking daily, socialising regularly, eating healthily, brain games, music, singing in a local choir and swimming when I can. Currently not in the Murray River. Support of the person with dementia and the carer are vital for stability of the disease and living your best life. As I mentioned during dementia week recently, forgetfulness isn't always part of ageing. So if someone you know is getting forgetful before 65, check it out with your GP and please get some help that is available. This is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was fantastic. Really, really, um, we're all really grateful for your sharing your story. I think one of the things that you said that really resonated with me as someone who lives with Yod too is uh, I still always feel guilty asking for help. So we know we need it. We know we need to ask for help. We know we need help, but it doesn't make it any easier for us. And it certainly doesn't make it easier for our families probably. Um, knowing that we feel guilty. Um, so thank you again, Sandy. And now I would like to welcome and uh, ask Vicky to um, give her presentation. Vicky is a family care partner for her husband who lives with Yod, but I'll let Vicky do the rest of her own introduction. Thanks, Vicky. Okay, Kaya, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you from the Wadjuk Butcher in WA. Um, so yes, Mike and I have been living with uh, young onset dementia for the past 10 years. And over that time, we've developed a pretty good toolbox to keep him socially connected and engaged in meaningful activities. So what's in the box and what works for Mike? Well, first, it helps to know a bit about Mike. He's an only child and he's an introvert by nature. He doesn't have children and his mum and stepdad live in South Australia. He's physically fit with no other health issues and the only medication he takes is the occasional carver tablet to quell agitation or anxiety and melatonin for sleep. Um, overcoming apathy, uh, which is a common presentation with dementia, is really the biggest uh, challenge we have to manage. Um, and it's tricky. Uh, he's hard to motivate and actually engage in activities. And he's certainly not happy in large group settings. So taking him to day clubs and social centres and the like really just doesn't work for him. So what does he enjoy? Well, he loves sport. In his school days, he won all the um, athletic and swimming carnivals and went on to become a fine footy player. He played for West Adelaide before going to live and work in Papua New Guinea, where he joined the Aviat Football Club and is still connected to those teammates here in Australia 50 years later on. So clearly sporting prowess and mateship have significant meaning for Mike. He loves listening to music. He's got an expansive CD collection across many genres. He's an adventurer. He loves bushwalking. And getting out in nature, he completed the Bibbulmun Trek end to end in 2012 and was on Mount Everest in 2015 when the earthquake struck. And clearly he's lived to tell the tale. So I'm going to share my screen and just um, show you, um, well, meet Mike. And I'm going to talk about how his strengths and his social support networks uh, keep him well and allow him to live the best possible life with dementia. So here we go. 
Okay. So you can see here we have his best buddy, which is George. Um, and George has been with Mike since he was a puppy. They both look out for each other and are a pretty tight unit. And George keeps Mike very busy with grooming, daily walks, making his chicken and rice dinners. And certainly um, I can say that having a pet is absolutely one of the best therapies and George is worth his weight in gold. He's definitely a keeper. We go to the gym twice a week where Mike gets one-on-one -on -one support with an exercise physiologist. And sadly, this gym that you see here is no longer operating and we're still looking for a place with the right vibe and if that's a fit for us. And what worked well with this gym that really is hard to find is that it was small, uh, not fancy, and the patrons were um, aging like us or they were younger and living with a disability. And it was a real sense of community. And I knew I was in the right place when the trainer Mike had um, immediately switched on to patrons and noticed that when certain play uh, songs were playing, that their mood lifted and they actually engaged more in the activities and the exercises they were doing. And he started to create playlists for his clients. Um, and then you've got Michael playing the harmonica and um, the discovery of music therapy, I've got to say, has been um, a, an absolute delight. And it wasn't something anyone told me about or I knew about prior. And I happened to stumble upon it when I read an article in the West Australian that featured Hayley, who is going to be presenting shortly, and it described how she uses music therapy uh, to support well-being in aged care and disability services. And um, so, and the other thing, and there were a couple of random things that happened that made me realise that music therapy, therapy could be a, a real game changer for Mike. So we were doing the dishes one morning and after breakfast, a song came on the radio and Mike happened to say, I remember that day. Dad and I were in the kitchen doing the dishes when it was announced that JFK was assassinated. And honestly, I just went, what? And then in that moment, I realised that the power of music to connect him with events in his times past was really powerful. And given that I have only been with Michael 15 um, years, there's a lot that I don't know about Michael. Um, and then friends happened to give him a harmonica randomly for a Christmas present. And he's never learned to read music nor play an instrument, but he definitely has an ear for music and has a good tone and rhythm. And um, with his massive um, CD collection spanning, you know, many different genres, that's been quite handy. So... Um, what we did is we actually curated his CD collection and um, I uploaded 1,500 of his songs onto an MP3 player. And Michael actually uses that to self-soothe. It's not unusual for him to go to his room when he's feeling a little bit stressed and needing downtime. He'll take George, plonk him on the bed, start playing his M3, uh, MP3 player, and he's got a lovely view of the back garden. So the ability for him to self-soothe is really helpful. It's a lot of fun. Haley comes fortnightly, and um, I might stop sharing now. So Haley comes fortnightly um, for a session with Mike, which he does look forward to, um, and it's fun. It lifts his mood, and Haley immediately tunes into what he's feeling, and she can get a sense of where he's at very quickly. And they improvise a lot. Uh, it's amazing how out of a song collection, the, the songs that have special meaning, like a trip to Vietnam, for example, or when he's on his nighttime adventures, sleep is a bit of an issue at the moment and he does all his nighttime wandering. They come up with songs that sort of uh, reflect what's going on for him uh, during that time. His cognitive and executive function and his ability to multitask is definitely improving. Uh, clearly, his neural pathways are really switched on um, while he's uh, under, you know, with Haley and, and following her lead. And or actually, she's really following his lead. Um, 
and that curating his CD collection has stimulated a lot of his memories and really helped with reminiscence. And that's been good for me to catch up on really what's happening, what's been going on in Mike's life. Um, and right now, sleep is a big issue for Michael. He goes on a lot of nighttime adventures and Hayley has spent a bit of time putting a playlist together, which is we're starting to integrate now into his nighttime routine and it's definitely helping. The other important thing um, for me to mention is social connection and the sad I guess consequence of living with dementia is that socially we become more and more isolated. We don't get invited out to group act, uh, group activities with our friends anymore. So it's really important for me to be creative and find ways to connect Michael, keep him connected. So on a community level, we belong to a bushwalking group and building on Mike's Bibbleman Track end-to-end -end, uh, journey that he took up. I signed him up with the Bibbleman Track Foundation and it did take a while, but they found a buddy who um, they partner together and um, are both volunteers, maintenance volunteers. So they're responsible for seven kilometres of the um, track and they go out on a quarterly basis. He's actually going out this week. And on Sunday, Mike actually went to a special presentation for all the volunteers and he was recognised one of many for five years um, service. So he's been doing that for a fair while now. And as I mentioned earlier, mateship is really important for Mike. He still catches up with um, some of his closest mates for a drink. Um, they come here or they take him out and when those guys from the who he played footy with all those years ago in Papua New Guinea get together for anything special, Mike's always included. And last year we even travelled to Queensland and they had a 50th year reunion <laughs> to celebrate winning the premiership in Papua New Guinea. So they had to go a long way to win a premiership. Um, so there aren't many perks of being a care partner, but one of them is having a companion card. And I have to say unashamedly that I use that as an incentive to entice his mates to take him out to footy games and the like, um, because they get to go for free. And last but not least, engagement with our peers has been probably a lifesaver at times. So a few years back, we established the Young Dementia Network and we have over 90 people in our network now. We have our own memory cafe and we organise social events. So we'll go on picnics together. Um, we have Christmas um, at gatherings and, you know, those sort of things. So each month we take turns at organising activities. And we have our own little we call it affectionately our yacht squad. So there's a few of us and we go on holidays together, like to Calbarry, to Esperance and that sort of thing. And let me tell you, it makes being away and holidaying so much easier when we can support each other. Um, we also go to the movies and help each other in the garden and other stuff like that. And as part of our network, something I think that's really special that's developed is for the past two years, we've actually had an annual event that we've named Yodyssey, the Art of Living Well with Dementia. And we showcase the um, artistic talent and music talent among our network. And we're supported by the Town of Vic Park. Uh, um, and it's a, a good way of, I guess, part of my advocacy work promoting uh, young onset dementia in the community and making the public more aware of um, what it is like to live with dementia. And really, that's a wrap from me. Thank you. That's fantastic, Vicky. Thank you so much for sharing. And if you have a look in the chat, you'll see lots of people, um, as they have with Sandy, it's just very grateful for such honest and wise sharing of how you are managing to support your husband um, uh, through music and lots of other ways. So thank you for that. Um, our next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Mori Voizibalan. Um, Mori is an engagement specialist. He works with people with dementia and P 
people who are isolated in residential care. And I will hand over to you, Murray, and let you do the rest of your intro, if that's okay. That sure is, Kate. Um, I'm, I'm on, I think I'm off mute now. Hello, um, thank you for um, inviting me and asking me to, to join you guys. And I, I just, sorry, Vicky, I was madly typing away just some points that you made because there were some things you said that I'd really like to pick up on that are, are profound for me. I would, I'm a, I'm a performer by background. That's where it all comes from. And I'd like to just share this quote uh, with you, if I may, that really sums up how I feel about um, what people like Haley do and what we do. And uh, it is from a guy called Dr. Bill Thomas, who set up the Eden Alternative <coughs> in America. And it's all progress in the human condition relies upon our ability to recognize and understand the difference between the way things are and the way things ought to be. And once we see that difference, we're given an opportunity to use our skills, our talents to pursue excellence in closing that gap. Um, that kind of sums up my kind of charter uh, in what I try to do. Um, I guess I just want to make sure I'm not still sharing, am I? Great. Okay, I'm back. Um, so what I want to do is sort of explain and talk through a little bit about what it is that I do and what creative therapeutic engagement actually means. So in a nutshell, uh, it's a therapeutic intervention that is based on playful creative engagement. It is not entertainment. Um, hopefully it's a bit entertaining, but it's not meant to be entertainment. It's designed as a one-on-one -on -one intervention. It reinforces positive memories and connections in a playful manner. And I'm trying to tap into individual interests and humour. And humour is, of course, one of the things that I'm really trying to zone in on. And what I guess one of my things is I like to try and create opportunities for what I call mutual mischief. Um, mutual mischief is not always appropriate to everybody, but it is quite remarkable how many people do respond and enjoy sitting in mischief. Um, and I think that that's something that I would want if it were me. Um, so I'm aiming to encourage socialization to create relationship. Uh, it's about creating opportunities for interaction on equal terms. It's about joy. It's about fun. It's about choice. And it's about advocacy and agency. And these things are um, <coughs> crucial, obviously, um, for all of us. Um, so what do I use? I use a bit of music. I play the ukulele. There's song, there's humour, there's playful banter, which many have, uh, we call smart assery. I hope that term is not offensive to people. Um, vaudeville, comedy, reminiscence, storytelling, poetry, puppetry, nonsense, chic, respect. I seek advice. I may use validation. I might just sit with people um, if that's what they need. And I'm using whatever it takes to foster a relationship. And those that I'm looking to work with are those that are experiencing depression, um, you know, which is leading to loneliness. People that are self-isolating as a response to going into residential aged care or perhaps as a response to uh, living with dementia. Yeah, and people that are experiencing anxiety, uh, living with Parkinson's, uh, stroke at any stage or presenting with um, distressed or, or behaviours, uh, reactive behaviours. And, and I join... Kate on trying to ban the term BPSD, which is a term that once was used to describe those behaviours, which of course we all well know are unmet needs. Um, and I, you know, I take my hat off to you, Kate, because you really do bring attention to banning that staff focused term, I call it, or a term of nuisance. I have seven partner sites, residential sites that I work for weekly. Um, they pay me directly in many ways as a consultant um, and as a therapeutic kind of expert and nut job. And I interact with all staff and I speak with families and I work with uh, the residents directly. I do work with people with young onset dementia, but primarily it's an older age group. So I just wanted to make that known. But what I am seeing is, of course, I'm seeing younger people with Parkinson's come into um, my circle. Um, and I see around about 60 to 70 individual people in one-on-one -on -one sessions every single week. Um, Vicky spoke about 
some of Mike's challenges. And the, yeah, this really resonated with me, Vicky, when you said these. I you talked about apathy, and you talked about motivation, and they're two things that we know. And so what I'm trying to do is to worm my way into um, someone's interest or circle of interest. And I aware that 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 sometimes people may reject. Um, offers of social interaction and my role is to try and work out how to make it so enticing and so interesting that they can't resist and but I need to walk the fine line of respect and choice at that same time so that's kind of challenging um, also Vicky talked about big groups not being so great which is why I work one-on-one -on -one. so it's a very intimate kind of work that I do and Vicky also spoke about music and meaning and I know that Hayley will speak more about this but I cannot describe how amazing music can be for most people. Not everyone relates to music in the same way, but also how it can activate um, a person and bring them to engagement. Um, I just want to share quickly a photo of my good friend who we have much appreciation. This sits on his wall. This is my friend Lee, who I'll be seeing in around about two hours. This is Lee and I follow Lee's lead. Um, he likes to sing pearly shells. He loves singing pearly shells and it was a, a fluke discovery, but I begin and I sing pearly shell and he'll sing pearly shells from the ocean, from the ocean. And he will lead the interaction um, here. Lee is singing and I'm following and I'm following the words that he creates because the words aren't always the same. Um, so uh, that's kind of what I do and what I love to do. And um, I think I might hand over to the marvellous Hayley Antipas to, um, to pick that up, but thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Mauro, that was wonderful. You didn't want to show your little video Vimeo clip before oh, we move look, on? Have you, have you got it there? Cause I, I do, yeah. Well, okay, we could, we could show this clip. This is a, a short clip of my good friend, Laurel, who I will also see today, but Laurel um, ha, is now in a Regency chair. So she's bed bound. This clip is of Laurel, um, after being activated by four or five songs, old time music, she played the piano accordion and you'll see music lives in her body. And this is me trying to create music, but then use social cues and banter to encourage her to use words which she normally doesn't, isn't able to form and use phrases which she never does. Let's hope that it works. Right. Let's hope. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, I, fe I feared that might happen. I think it's going to be hard to stream, Kate. So I am doing it direct yeah. from a downloaded it, file, it, not. Yeah, from... I know it. It does happen. All right. Well, what basically what's hap what happens with with Laurel is that as I play the ukulele, she starts to she moves in time with the music, and I change the tempo of the next song, and she will move to the rhythm, and then she does big finishes, which I set up for her. And then I'll use a bit of banter and she will respond and I will ask her things like, what should we play next? And she'll go, oh, uh, and I'll say, how about side by side? And she'll say, oh, side by side. And so people are usually amazed that um, she uses phrases and she, they're appropriate to topic. It's not that it's magic. It's just that I've tapped in to her interests and what I know of her. And I'm, I'm speaking to the individual and I'm trying to interact with her on equal terms it's uh that that's available and maybe you could share that link to others and they can go and look at it as they choose okay we'll do that when we do a mail out afterwards when the video of today's presentations uh, is available i'm sorry next... you said hello today yeah great thank you so our next speaker is Haley antipas and she's a registered neurologist music therapist and director of attuned health uh, practicing in Western Australia. And Hayley, I'll hand over to you. You can finish off your intro as you wish um, and uh, move on to your presentation. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Sandy and Vicky and Maury. It's a tough act to follow. Um, I'm actually going to kind of start at the end of what might be a typical presentation. Because as Vicky mentioned to you all, music therapy was really something that um, her and Michael came across kind of accidentally um, and when I talk with people um, there's really a lot of uh, 
unknowns about music therapy. People aren't sure how to access it or if they can access it and how it might help. So I'm actually going to start with a bit about how do you actually access music therapy. I'll just check that I'm sharing that with you all. So accessing music therapy, some people may be pleased to know that it is available through NDIS. So it's a capacity building therapeutic support if that's relevant to you and Attuned Health are a NDIS registered provider. People can also access music therapy through their home care package. Music therapy is an allied health profession, so it very much fits within that remit and scope of keeping you well and independent. Um, if you're self-managed, you can access it. And if you have a provider, you can speak to them about brokering the services of a music therapist, because most providers probably don't actually have a music therapist themselves. Um, and of course, as with any therapeutic support, there is private options available. Where do you go to find a music therapist, <laughs> which is the, uh, the burning question most people ask. The Australian Music Therapy Association have a wonderful resource on their website where you can actually find a music therapist. So you can pop in your postcode, uh, you can put some information about your diagnosis if you would like a therapist that's experienced working with that diagnosis um, and you can find somebody close to you. Um, and of course, Attuned Health have resources as well. So you can pop on our website. Uh, we've got information about music therapy. You can self-refer or make a referral through our page. And we have music therapy services in Western Australia, but to provide consulting services throughout the world. Okay, so now that I've started at the end, <laughs> um, a little bit more about me, I guess. Um, as Kate said, I'm a registered music therapist, also a dual qualified neurologic music therapist. Um, but I think more importantly, I love working with systems. So as a music therapist, I really work with the whole family unit or the whole care unit in those uh, professional and residential care settings. And for me, my passion is really about how do we embed and integrate some of these music therapy strategies into daily living so that people can really harness the potential power of music. So I'm also uh, doing a PhD at the University of Melbourne and it's great to see one of our uh, research fellows on this call. Um, and uh, yeah, my PhD is really looking at the effects of that skill sharing. So music therapy as a uh, allied health profession works across lots of different areas of functioning or areas of health and well-being, if you prefer. So what I wanna do is just give you a couple of examples drawing on my experience working with Vicky and Mike to help bring to life how music can support you in so many different ways. Um, and this is really, I think, where that connection between creative engagement and music therapy comes in. So Vicky talked to the fact that, um, you know, Mike was really interested. I remember this very clearly when I first met him. Uh, he said, I want to stay sharp. That, that was his goal. That was a really wonderful goal for me to work with. <clears throat> so we, sorry. Excuse me, an occupational hazard of a music therapist that we are get tired voices, too much singing. Um, so we, I create uh, little games or activities with Mike that are quite structured, that allow him to work through all of his different executive and cognitive functions. So an example of this that is something that you can even replicate at home might be, you know, sometimes Mike will have two different instruments and I'll provide an instruction that when he hears certain sounds, he would play one of those instruments, and if he hears a different sound, he would play the other instrument. And while that might seem like a simple activity, it's using lots of different cognitive skills like attention, memory, planning, initiation and inhibition. So it's actually a really simple but effective exercise. And I use lots of these different little uh, activities with Mike. And as Vicky said, we really started to notice that he was 
more focused and particularly his multitasking was becoming more comfortable for him. And it's really interesting uh, that Vicky describes Mike as an introvert and, and kind of discusses those challenges with apathy and motivation. Because it's certainly something, I remember when Vicky first said that to me, I thought, really? Because Mike just seems to come to life and be so motivated when I'm working with him in this music therapy context. Physical functioning hasn't been a big focus um, for Mike, so I won't talk to that too much, but it's just important for you to know that that is an area that music therapists work across and that there's a significant body of evidence. As I've been working with Mike over the last couple of years, our goals have evolved and um, gone around in circles and come back in lots of different ways. And something that has started to come up is there's certain days where Mike just finds that words aren't really working for him and would communicate that the case for me by playing the song, Words Don't Come Easy. So when he drink, brings that song into our sessions, I know that on that particular uh, day, words aren't really going to be our primary mode of communicating. That being said, generally within a couple of minutes of playing a familiar song, Mike will start singing, joining in, and a lot of the words actually come back to him through music. So it's a beautiful way of crossing that bridge between communication and psychosocial well-being in that music creates this vessel for Mike to be able to express himself. Um, and we've recently been writing a song about Mike's experience of living with dementia that touches on some of those nighttime adventures that Vicky uh, touched on earlier. One of the other things I wanted to share that has happened with Mike, which is just a beautiful experience, I think it's worth talking to, is in relation to his memory. And Vicky mentioned the song about their holiday in Vietnam. And it's actually the, the song Proud Mary by Credence Clearwater Revival. And a long time ago, early on when I started working with Mike, we introduced a bit of a change of lyrics. So rather than singing the typical rolling, rolling, rolling on a river, we change those words to cooking, cooking, cooking in Hoi An, which is a reference to part of that holiday. And interestingly, even after we haven't played that song for months, if I ever come back to that, all I have to do is provide that first little cue or prompt, cooking, cooking, and Mike will finish that, uh, that lyric or the phrase and then immediately start talking about that holiday. So music is this, has this beautiful capacity to um, evoke those memories uh, and autobiographical memories for him. And I must confess that I have had to learn the um, Port Adelaide football song uh, and have some beautiful moments uh, reminiscing about times where Michael has spent dancing in his living room. Okay, so music therapy typically, as you can see from some of these examples, we're really talking about quite a traditional therapeutic relationship. We're really working directly with an individual. But as Vicky talked to, especially with regard to Mike's sleep recently, we've also been looking at how do we integrate those music therapy strategies into Mike's life so that he can continue living well on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, this is really that connection between music therapy, which is a discrete and distinct sort of allied health service that people can access, and the concept of creative engagement and living well through creativity. And, and this is the area that I'm really passionate about. As a music therapist, how do we work uh, with a whole family unit or care unit? This area is, this is an area gaining a huge amount of interest and research. Um, and there's a hot off the press paper, which I haven't included here, uh, from a wonderful colleague at the University of Melbourne, Kate McMahon, who's another PhD candidate, who has um, interviewed family members of people living with dementia about their experiences of learning to mu use music strategies and music therapy strategies. And one of the really interesting findings that came from that was that music is not magic. And um, 
family members really shared that actually it was difficult to learn what strategies worked and they had to be patient um, and, you know, take time to find the right approaches. So I think for me, that would be the message that I want to, to leave you with. And I'll turn the screen share off so I can see your faces. Um, is that music is an absolutely incredible tool and music therapists can help you to build some of those strategies into your, into your day, but that it's not magic and it does take work as well, right? just as Maury explained. So thank you. I hope that's helpful. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was fantastic. Um, there are some questions I have um, to ask and there might be questions coming in from other people. But my first question to you, Hayley, and we were chatting about this earlier, is why are we calling normal activities that people love therapies? Is there another way? I had a feeling you might ask me this, Kate. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, Kate, Kate and I had a, a very impassioned discussion about the, the overuse of the word therapy um, as we were preparing for this call. And for me as a music therapist, I often kind of, check and reconcile um, is this just my ego being bruised you know music therapy is a term that we hear so often and often in relation to things that you know music activities and experiences that are not music therapy there's not a, a profession registered professional involved so I often question is it just my ego is that is that why I'm sort of uncomfortable with people calling it music therapy um, but for me, I think it really comes down to all of us in our lives. We listen to music and it um, at certain times can help us feel better. Not always, but certainly, you know, you might be out with friends having a great time and music might be a big part of that. But we wouldn't necessarily say, I'm going home to do music therapy. You know, I'm going to listen to my music and it helps me feel better. So why all of a sudden when we come into an aged care system or especially when we walk into a residential aged care facility, all of a sudden, all of these parts of our life that are just part of life become therapy. You know, all of a sudden playing with a balloon is balloon therapy and going, you know, drawing a painting is art therapy. I think it's really important that we um, use the word therapy appropriately so that people who do need extra support are able to get those services and there not be misunderstandings about what they're accessing. That's great. Thank you, um, Hayley. And I think for me sometimes, you know, I hear people saying, oh, I don't want to go to something that's therapy. There's a, it's a bit of a put-off when, when it's called therapy, but it is a, a bigger question for another group. Um, I haven't got any other questions from other people. I have got a question for you, Maury. Um, and I was wondering, uh, what's the importance of being an actor or being involved <laughs> in acting to do what you do? Um, so, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this, this one. The, the thing of acting is that it's a discipline that's, it's a real discipline and it's in its pure form, it's kind of looking at what drives your character. So you've got to figure out and sit in the psychology of your character and understand what is driving them to make these decisions. And then what is the overall overarching reason why the writer has put me in this piece and what is it trying to say? So you're trying to figure out um, the character and, and, and their motivations, but then you're trying to figure out how you express that physically with gestures, cadence of voice, looks, you know, um, you know, and those gestures may be, you know, like when you can't confront things and you close your eyes a lot, or maybe you're very direct. So when you have that sense of curiosity about what drives people, and I think that curiosity is the most important ingredient in the work I do. People talk about empathy. They talk about emotional intelligence, but what is emotional intelligence, right? I think it's curiosity because when you're generally interested in what makes another person tick, when you're genuinely interested in that and it's not about a gender and it's not about you're there for therapy, as we were talking about, what flows from that is authenticity. And I think people read authenticity, particularly in the environment of residential aged care, because most people are there for a task 
and it's a transaction. I'm not there for any transaction other than just be someone and create mischief or be a part. I, I always say, people say to me, what's your job? And I say, well, my job's to annoy people. How am I going? <laughs> and they say, pretty good. Can I get that in writing? So it's all about creating those spaces. And so acting and improvisation, because I'm also have a background, a very strong background in improvisation is important because I'm not performing at people. I'm throwing little grenades into the middle of the ring to see what they throw back at me. And that's where the interaction goes. So although I might plan stuff, I have no idea what a session may contain. And I'm working on instinct and I'm working on what they are giving me and its presence. Just quickly on therapy, I couldn't agree more. I use the word therapeutic and that's only to get my foot in the door to managers and leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I think that music, joy, fun, mischief should just be part of daily life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be special, but unfortunately it is. And so my, as I said in that quote earlier, I'm trying to use all my heart and my skills to bring it because when that's me, that's what I want. Yeah, thank, thank you, Murray. And, and I mean, sometimes adding the word therapy means you get funding for it. So I understand there is some rationale in that. The I've got some other, yeah, I've got some questions for you and also Hayley, but I wanted to ask um, Sandy, if she's still here, um, how much uh, listening to music has helped her with her experience of living with young onset dementia. Sandy, are you still with us? And while we wait for Sandy, if she is still here, maybe Vicky as a family care partner, um, I prefer that term to carer, does music support you in your role? Um, look, I'm, I do really like music, but I'm not as um, tuned into music, I guess, as what Mike is. But I have to say, it's just, you know, it lightens up the place and it's just what we need sometimes to break the, um, the monotony and some of the, you know, and what's going on in our day. So it's absolutely to lift mood, to get us into a different space. Um, it's really good. And look, I just love what I've really loved the most about it is the discovery of getting to know Michael more. Mm. You know, in our situation, the reality, reality is I've been with Mike 15 years and 10 of those or more have been living with dementia. And actually it's his mates and everyone else around him. They know far more about Michael than I do. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. that's interesting in itself. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Um, I've got a question from Kate, Sandy. Um, yep. Sorry, Kate. That's I right. didn't... Oh, Sandy, you're there. Great. Yes. Fantastic. Yes, just a little glitch. That's okay. And I'm waiting for your um, but, So question. my my question to you was, um, do you find that listening to music is helpful, um, particularly Absolutely. on the, I suppose, particularly Absolutely. on the tough days, you know, with the tough times with dementia? Yes. Um, I've, I've, as I said, I've always loved music. And it's always been a comfort to me in a lot of different ways, um, whether it's hymns or whether it's country or whether it's, you know, anything. It's just depending on what I choose is the mood that I'm in. That's great. Yeah, so, that's really good. Thank you. I've just been in a choir um, in Corion and that's just been fantastic. Great. I'm not very good at singing. I love listening to music and I did join the Uni SA Choir just as COVID was coming and then the COVID pandemic shut down the choir but my family said it was my singing that shut down the choir so I prefer to listen to music. Um, Sam was interested to know um, are there any music therapy trials that people might want to be involved in or know about? Yeah, um, I, I saw you pop that in the chat, Sam, and I have just sent a message to a colleague to ask if we're still recruiting, but I think we're at capacity um, for one of our studies. But my PhD is involved with a much larger uh, research project, which is called Match Music Attuned. Uh, now I've forgotten it. <laughs> Music Attuned Technology uh, Care via eHealth, something like that. Um, and we do have a website, so um, and we have a wait list for some of those studies. So you can have a look on the website and read about those research projects. 
The website is music attuned, A double T U N E D, care, C A R E, dot com. Maybe you could put that uh, in the chat box. I'll too. pop that in Thanks, the chat. Thanks, Hayley. That'd be great. And we'll send it out afterwards as well um, in yeah. our email. Um, that's great. Thank you. And there's a question for Murray, and I want to just add to that question. Um, when I was working in healthcare sales and I used to visit lots of nursing homes um, uh, selling products there, I used to say to myself, God, I'm going to be in trouble when I end up in aged care because I like the music of the 50s, you know, the Vera Lynn music. I don't like the music that tends to go with my age group. Um, but how do you deal with the age differences and, and different musical tastes of clients, Murray? I have to have a really broad song list. I'm getting asked, asked, I'm now being asked for the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Um, I play all the golden oldies, but I play um, K Sera, there's Moonlight Bay, um, country songs, Sandy, um, King of the Road, North to Alaska. I mean, I have to have this broad variety of eras and genres. And so that's been difficult because I'm not a musician. I taught myself to play the ukulele when I got into this work, but I have a long list and sometimes I have to, you know, I have a little folder, but that is important because, um, yeah, I do, I do, it does help if the, it helps if the music is right. And sometimes it's a lot of experimenting with my friend Lee that I just showed you. I played lots of songs that he kind of engaged with and, and didn't, but then when I played Pearly Shells, it just began. And so the thing I would also say, is that I, in early days, people would, staff would say to me, you play that song all the time. Can you play something different? And I would say, I'm not playing it for you. <laughs> I'm playing it for Lee and I'm sick of it too. I really hate it, but it, he likes that song and I'm playing it. So yeah, lots and lots of music choices because it's important. Nobody wants to hear you are my sunshine that's my age. I don't want to hear it. And well, I, I love that song. <laughs> so when Haley comes to work with me, when I am in aged care, Maury likes Nirvana. Haley, can you write that down? <laughs> yeah, that's right, Sandy. There's a, there's a comment in the chat from Linda Henderson. It's great to see you again, Linda, even though it's only online. Um, and Linda's partner who has young onset dementia was a musician herself and singer. Um, and I've had this, I think this is what you're referring to, Linda, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been through a period of not liking the music that I used to love, classical music, because I couldn't remember the composers, I couldn't remember the names of, well, you know, the, the names of the songs and the music I was listening to. So I went through a real period of not being able to listen to my favourite music, which was classical, because it just made me sad not remembering Linda, did you want to comment to that on your experience of, you know, being care partner with Vida and her being a musician? Yes, yeah, sure. for a chat um, about that? Yes, yeah, she has very advanced dementia now and um, she's no longer living at home and her physical abilities have changed, etc. But she's still walking and smiling and laughing and eating and all of that. Um but because she was a musician all her life, and not just a musician, she's a photographer, did a lot of art, etc. What we discovered over the years was that the things that she no longer did as well, she didn't want to participate in, generally speaking. So that would be consistent with what you experienced, Kate, because for mm -hmm. you, knowing what the music was, was important. Now, for Vida, it doesn't matter well, it used to matter to her and she would pull out lots and lots of CDs to get me to listen to this, that and the other person and tell me who they were and how she knew about them and had she met them, had she played with them, etc. cetera. Um, but over time, when we used to spend quite a lot of time outside on our deck, I'd say, do you want to listen to some music? And she said, no, it's going to change my mood. And I want my mood. I don't yeah. want the music to change me. Now, she loves all kinds of music except rap, everything. Oh, country rock she can stand, but not country. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's she was very well known at one point. And I think that she also uh, 
is concerned or was concerned before she met you, Kate, that she didn't want people to remember her and to feel sorry for her. Here's another one who's got younger onset dementia. Um, you know, um, we lost Malcolm Young, for example, many years ago and, and others. Uh, so it's very difficult now to know what kind of music to play for her. Uh, I take her out in the car quite often and we do nice drives. And if I put certain music on, she'll laugh and tap, And but she's not singing any longer. And this is a woman who has perfect pitch and relative pitch, uh, but her, her, her language difficulties have advanced to the, that point where she really doesn't sing along any longer. But I have videos of her singing to her own performances. Um, and I'm not sure how to reintroduce that into her life and how to introduce that into the facility where she's living. Um, our group in, uh, I'm one of the founding members along with Vita and others of the Kayama Dementia Inclusive Community, which has been going for eight years. And we've recently started some new initiatives dancing with dementia and alchemy chorus, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know if I can get any of these residents to participate in any of it. And that concerns me. I, I think yeah. it's partly because there's this concept that these people who live in this unit, although they're free to go out, et cetera, if someone will take them out, yeah. which is another question. We, uh, I will have to all, wrap all up now, Linda, is, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, sorry. sorry. We're, mm. That's okay. We're no running out of time, and I, I think what your your comment has really highlighted, Linda, is that uh, you know we should never make assumptions about anybody's tastes mm. and preferences. But certainly, when dementia comes along, um, past tastes and preferences may change dramatically for all sorts yeah. of reasons. So, um, for people like Mori and and Haley to be working with people with dementia is just such an important role. I'd just really like to thank our speakers, um, Haley and Sandy and Vicky and Mori, and also Sam for being a sort of co-host in the background. And especially thank everyone who's been here today. It's been a terrific um, webinar. Thank you again, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. See you later. We should have had some music. <laughs> <laughs> next next time, Murray, we will. I'll just wait. Trailer for sale or rent. Rooms to let for 50 cents. No phone, no pool, no pets. Ain't got no cigarettes. Where's Sandy? <laughs> We're going. Oh, Bye. You are. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Murray. I, I chose. I chose not to harmonise with you, Maury, for the sake of the time <laughs> delay. <laughs> it's okay if you harmonise, I go off. I'm terrible at that stuff. Yeah, Thanks, that was a fantastic way to end. Thanks, Maury. Bye, everyone.